Objectivism as a philosophy, and this course is called Objectivism Through Induction. So I want to start by saying a word about what is philosophy. It's the study of fundamentals, and specifically of principles defining man's proper relationship to existence. I define philosophy as the science of man's relationship to existence. Metaphysics, of course, as a branch of philosophy, brings in the fact of existence, but every other branch is man's relation, how man should behave so as to conform to existence and thereby gain some crucial end. Epistemology defines the principles of proper thought so as to enable us to achieve cognition, knowledge. Ethics defines the principles of proper action so as to enable us to achieve survival. Government, uh, the principles of proper social organization so as to enable us to protect individual rights. Art, principles of the uh, creation of artworks so as to enable them to achieve their function of condensing philosophy. In all cases, it's a, it's a branch that studies how man should behave in a given area in order to conform to uh, existence and thereby achieve a certain end. And the question is, how would you ever know what principles reality requires for you to conform to it? And the only conceivable way is to discover them by the study of existence, including the study of man. And therefore, the conclusion is that philosophic ideas have to be reached exclusively on the basis of observation of reality. They have to be learned and proved, read off from reality. And in this sense, philosophy is not unique. It is like any subject, whether you're studying beetles or stars or whatever. You have to start with observations. You do not properly in any subject start with books, people, or lectures. I'm saying you do not start with books, people, or lectures. The only value of these things are for them to re other people to report their observations to you and thereby save you time or to guide you in making your own observations and save time. But the only cognitive source the only source of actual knowledge is the study of the data out there. So if you think of any subject at all, leaving aside introspection, the frame of reference is always outward. You, uh, your gaze when you're thinking should be your perspective, your focus out there, outside. It should not be turned in on yourself. It should not be a process of memory when you're thinking. It should not be a process of trying to recall what was once clear to you. It's not digging in your subconscious for what was in some book or some lecture or what some person once said. Once you know a given fact and you file it in essentials, <clears throat> the relation between your mind and that fact should be no longer mediated by other people in any way, including by their books. You have to be as if you're the only man alive thinking of this subject. That's true of all subjects, and it's true equally of uh, philosophy. A human source of your philosophy is a bad thing, unless that's just a time saver that you drop out at a certain point. It should never be essential to you when you think of philosophy, that I wrote a book or gave a lecture or that Ayn Rand uh, wrote a book. Uh, that's fine. Those things are fine as maps to point out where to look or to give you an advance report on what she found. But you have to make the trip, be focused on the road and not on her report. So the first message is when you're stuck, look out. Do not look in. Don't try to take an inventory of the fragments that have come to you from within your mind. Forget about that and look out. Now, when we look out, we uh, contact reality through perception of concretes. 
We have to reach the basic truths we're looking for, the principles, by derivation from concretes. And the name for that process of reaching principles from concretes is induction. And by the nature of philosophy, or in fact of all science, that is the only way to proceed. Now, induction, that's the I in OTI. They've given you objectivism and now induction, and through, you can get out of the dictionary. Induction is generalization from perception. That's all I mean by it. And generalization, I mean simply what you mean in logic class. You end up with a statement of the form, all S is P. What's well, called a universal truth. Every member of a certain class has a certain attribute. Every philosophic principle should be reformulatable in the terms all S is P. For instance, cause and effect, you could say every event has a cause. What about if I say selfishness is a virtue? Every act of selfishness, properly construed, is life-sustaining. Where And another universal, every act of self-sacrifice is self-destructive. Or one more example, suppose I say to you, uh, education is not a proper function of government. What is the universal all SSP? All government education is a violation of rights, and you could even go on another one and say all violations of rights are destructive of the mind and ultimately of life. So you've got to start thinking of philosophy uh, philosophic principles as a summation of concretes. All cases of causality, all cases of government education, all cases of selfishness. Do not think of them as relations of terms. Selfishness by its nature is virtue because the definition of virtue is so and so. Think of them as summaries of concretes. And the point is that philosophy is an inductive subject, and the only way to reach its conclusions is by observing a number of instances and then generalizing. You do not reach philosophic conclusions from definitions. On the contrary, as we're going to see repeatedly, definitions themselves come from induction. So if you don't use induction, you can't get started at all. Now, Ayn Rand used to say to me, she never got to write this, but she said it repeatedly that induction is the only way to reach new philosophic principle. Deduction, she said, was not important in philosophy. It's important derivatively only in, uh, it has two main uses. One, it enables us to apply principles already known to new concretes. You know, once you know all men are mortal, then you can apply it to Bob Smith, and then so he's mortal too. But that's simply an application. And the other value of deduction is polemics. If you know this principle is true, then so-and-so's theory must be false. But in this course, we are not concerned with trivialities. And, and, and trivialities in this context means applications and polemics. We're concerned with how do you reach positive, broad fundamentals? And the answer is only by induction. Now, philosophic induction, in one sense, is easier than induction in any other subject because it takes little or no specialized knowledge. Uh, presumably, we have to use only observations common and easily available to all men at all times anywhere in the world, regardless of their special uh, jobs. There are a few exceptions, but on the whole, that's true. It's universal fundamentals that confront us everywhere. That's what philosophy is. It's not something esoteric or super complex or full of technicalities. And in this regard, it's infinitely easier than inducing the laws of physics. The whole goal of philosophy is to condense all the complexities of the universe into a few simple formula to make the whole universe clear via a handful, a relative handful, that's all there is in philosophy, 
of interrelated principles that you could easily hold, consult, and use as you need. So it's a pretty easy subject. But unfortunately, for the same reason, namely, the principles are so universal and so abstract, meaning they're so far from the directly perceivable, that uh, they take the whole universe or, or every human action in relation to the universe and condense it into one principle that it has its own difficulties, precisely because it, it is such an incredible condensation. And the problem is that you overload the mind with more units than it can handle if you don't do it correctly. And then you try to escape this problem by collapsing into floating abstractions, which are just cut loose from concretes, and that becomes rationalism. Now, I'm going to give you a very brief example, an excerpt from one of my early conversations with Ayn Rand about thinking in principles, I've told this story in OPAR and also in my 30 years with Ayn Rand, that memoir, uh, and I'm going to give you just an excerpt from it. I was talking to her about the evil of lying, and we spent the whole first part, she asked me to give lies, and then she would show why. No matter what lie I gave, it was hopeless, and I gave all kinds of different lies, but I could never find one that I could get away with that she couldn't show me was self-defeating. And she summed up at a certain point, she said, you see, you can't get away with these lies because uh, they're all assaults on reality and you can't succeed in a war in reality. I'm sure you see why. And, uh, you know, uh, it was a little tenuous to me. I was uh, still a teenager. You can't succeed in a war on reality. So I groped inward. I'm giving you a report now. You know, We'd already had this long discussion about why lies are an assault on reality. And then she just threw out, and of course, you can't succeed in that. So I groped inwards, why? To try to find, what could I find in my subconscious uh, that I could deduce from quickly why you can't succeed in a war so that I could get over this problem. And I came up with, um, oh, I remember now, you can't affect reality by your evasion. And therefore, reality, if you try to war against it, you must lose. But this was completely floating in my, my mind at this point because it wasn't concretized. It was something I grabbed from an earlier discussion uh, and I remembered and dug, uh, dug it out of my uh, subconscious. So I already I had a patch of fog there where I thought I had a clear argument. I did have the courage to say to her, well, why do you have to have a war on all of reality? Why can't you get away with evading a few selected points of reality or with, you know, warring on just a few points? And then she said to me briefly, well, you know, all facts are interconnected and to evade one commits you to evading all. And that was a whole new massive generality that I'd never heard of. And that was thrown at me. And I'm not criticizing her. That's the way philosophic development and thinking goes. I was trying to digest uh, uh, all the earlier stuff, and now I said to her, well, can you, could you give me an example how all facts are interconnected? And then she went into, as an example, well, consider the issue of God and how it has implications for biology and this and astronomy and this and that. And suddenly, uh, I'm focusing on a completely different range of concretes, and I have a glimmer that everything is interconnected, but there's so many things from the preceding discussion that I hadn't yet clarified or concretized that is just too much for my mind to hold. So I was either going to just literally tune out or go blank because I couldn't hold it all, or what I did is drop reference to concretes altogether because it's just too much to cope with and fill in instead with a formula, and I just put it all in my mind as lie equals being against one fact, being against one fact equals being against all facts, therefore lie equals being against all facts, therefore you have to fail. Now, if you want to have anyone at that point had given me an, another lie, I could not have run it through that formula. I wouldn't have known what the hell is the connection between the lie and the formula. 
But the point is, all I could do at that point was have an abstract summary of the discussion. Now, that summary would be okay if every point stood in my mind as an induction from concretes. But the point is that for me, it stood as a substitute for concretes because I couldn't hold all those concretes. And the point illustrated by this example is only that the amounts of material that come under philosophic principles are so vast and the level of abstraction is so high up that if you have not assimilated every step by induction and automatization before you go to the next step, the chain immediately snaps. There's a breach in your thinking. There's no way to keep your mind in continuing with even a veneer of coherence except by turning each point into a floating summary and thereby you make room for more and more because it's just words now and that becomes rationalism rationalism is a crutch now of course you have to drop specific concretes to think but the idea is to drop the measurements while retaining steady access to the range of concretes that would embody these measurements. If you drop the concretes as such altogether, and even the potential of access back to them, then uh, uh, you've dropped reality, and you are finding security. In other words, something finite that you can deal with, you're finding that in the verbal formulation not in your grasp of the range of concretes. And then you just get to from one verbal formulation to the next by pulling in or remembering or constructing some definition here or there, and that is rationalism. So I would say rationalism psychoepistemologically is a shortcut to reduce the pressure of the crow. If you're new to objectivism, the crow is just a way of saying there's only so much that you can hold in your mind at any given moment. And if the pressure gets too great, you either have to reduce the number of units in your mind or you tune out and you just go blank. And rationalism is a way in good objectivists of reducing the pressure on the crow by substituting an empty word for too many concretes that they can't hold. Um, in effect, it's the occupational disease of ambitious philosophers who want answers, truths, and absolutes, but cannot do it while continuously shuttling back and forth between the concretes and the principles. And uh, unfortunately, it's all but universal in philosophy, rationalism, among so-called empiricists, just as much as among rationalists and among objectivists. And it's very widespread in the more theoretical branches of science and in math. I'm speaking now of better people, not because of moral flaws in these people, but because of the inherent overloading of the mind to which there seems to be no solution but floating abstraction. By the way, another reason for the widespread uh, rationalism is the fact of polemics. By polemics, I mean the attempt to refute your opponents. It's very hard to refute anybody by induction because if you try to give them an inductive argument, they'll find a thousand ways to say, oh, but what about this example? What about this example? You have to be honest to learn from induction. And therefore, most people in philosophy think the only way to coerce their opponents is to create an ironclad deductive argument. A is B and B is C, therefore A is C, you can't get out, there is no escape. Now, of course, even there they can escape, but it's harder. So if your motive is polemics, you're going to be drawn to rationalism and you're going to find induction very unsatisfying because you get nothing really to say when some swine brings in 10 other irrelevant examples and laughs at you, you're going to have to just shrug and say, well, you figured it out for yourself, goodbye. But if you're fixated on polemics, there's nothing I can do for you. But then there's nothing reality can either. You've changed into a, a completely worthless life of trying to answer all the crazy people. And that is a super lifetime occupation. So give it up at the outset where you have to reach the maturity 
where you can listen to somebody give an insane argument and smile and say, I have no comment on that. I don't agree with it. And I'm now I'm going to watch the Titanic and see something happy instead. <laughs> uh, and as long as it gnaws at you that you can't construct an argument that will force this swine to capitulate, you're nowhere philosophically or intellectually. Uh, now, this course is designed to uh, derive objectivist ideas step by step from observation. Put it this way, not by finding the idea's place within a set of other ideas. Not, that's what a rationalist does. He locates each idea in relation to other ideas, and then he has a whole chain starting with some alleged self-evidency. What you have to do is relate an idea to reality, not to other ideas. Now, obviously, you can relate a valid idea to other ideas. And it's important to connect your ideas. Nobody's saying you should hold each one disconnected. But the correspondence theory is the true theory of truth, not the coherence theory. In other words, truth is the relation between an idea and reality. It's not the relation between an idea and a system of ideas. Before you can relate an idea to other ideas, before you can insert it into any logical structure or any system, you first have to see, does it correspond to reality? Is it true? This applies to every idea. The first assignment has got to be, can I read it off from the data in reality? Can I see it as nothing more than a summary of endless observations? Can I see it? as a description of material accessible everywhere I look outside. Now, when you can say yes to that, that means you can shuttle easily between the concretes, the perceptual instances, and the idea. You can see the idea in the concretes and the concretes in the idea. When that's automatized in your mind, so it's just like you hear the word table, you could see millions of tables and instantly know they're tables, or walk around seeing tables and right away say table. Once you can do that, then you can relate table to chair, to bed, to furniture, to artifact, etc. And the same thing is true of philosophic principles. Once you can go back and forth from the concrete to the principle, you can then carry your abstract formulation in your head merely as words and relate it to other principles, assuming they're properly processed. But the relation, the integration to other knowledge comes after the mastery of reality on the individual level. So a good self-test of rationalism is where do you start a thinking process? Where does your mind begin? What is the first thing you are eager to look at or get on your mental screen in order to feel, I've made a beginning, I've made a start? Now, if the first thing that you want in front of you is a definition, that's bad. Not that it's bad per se to start with the definition. It may be crucial. As long, however, as that definition is a device pointing you to a whole field of concretes in reality. But it's very bad to start with a definition if that's a way of getting you launched into a world of words and deductive proofs. And I'm going to show you in a minute on a real example what that would consist of. The test of whether you're a rationalist, the first test, is what floods your mind at the outset, whether it has a definition to prompt it or not. A flood of perceptual concretes or a string of philosophic language. And if it's the latter, you have no hope in that thought process. Now, I say flood deliberately. It is not. It is not sufficient to eke out a few examples on the margins and say, well, I've done my duty by reality and now I'm going back to my deductive chain. That would be like you said, table. Oh, God, I remember there was a table somewhere. Oh, I vaguely remember there was a white thing. I'm not exactly sure of the shape, but I think it had ashtrays on it. Okay, now I've concretized table. Now, table equals so-and-so. That is what people do with philosophy. You've got to have as many concretes come right to you as come to you with the word table. If they don't, you don't know the principle. 
So when I say a flood of concretes, that's what you have got to reach. Now, all this is, is pretty general by way of introduction, so I want to start by actually inducing a simple, simple example, simpler than anything we're going to do in this course, but just as a paradigm at the outset. I want to start with the law of cause and effect. I'm taking that because it's almost an axiom. It's close to an axiom, so it's available implicitly to children and savages. Therefore, even philosophy students uh, should be able to, to do it. And thanks to Aristotle and the Greeks, the induction is pretty easy. Now, uh, I said close to an axiom, just to clarify it to you. A true axiom, like existence exists or A is A, cannot be reached by induction. You can't reach an, indu uh, uh, an axiom by any reasoning. By definition, it's where you start. It's the basis that makes all reasoning possible. So uh, the real axioms are simply self-evident. Uh, but there is a certain parallel between uh, axioms and things which are reached by induction. Namely, you reach axioms by observation, and axioms are universals. Uh, they're all in the form, whatever exists, exists. Whoever is conscious is conscious, etc. They're all universal propositions. The law of cause and effect is not an axiom, so it can be reached by uh, induction. It's very closely related, but it's not a pure axiom. Now, the first thing I want to do is tell you what would a rationalist do, and then show you why that's hopeless. Here's a rationalist, and I've, I've had, I couldn't tell you how many students uh, say the equivalent of this when you ask them to prove cause and effect. Uh, well, they say, uh, there's only three theoretical possibilities. A thing either acts apart from its nature, against its nature, or in accordance with its nature. Who could think of another possibility? Now, it's impossible to act apart from its nature because what's acting? There's nothing to act. And it's impossible to act against its nature because that would be a contradiction which is impossible by the law of contradiction. Therefore, the only possibility must be it acts in accordance with its nature, and therefore there's a law of cause and effect because everything acts according to its nature. Now, see... There are philosophy students, objectivists, who can do that with everything. It doesn't make any difference what. They construct their little deductive uh, scheme. Now, there's no use telling me, didn't I say that in OPAR? Because I did not say that uh, uh, in OPAR. In OPAR, there's something like that as a summary resting entirely on induction from instances, not as a self-contained rationalist proof. Now, what is wrong with this proof, so-called, before uh, we go to the proper induction? Let's just say, where did this person come up with the idea that there's only three alternatives? It's either apart from its nature, thing either acts apart from its nature, against it, or in accordance with it. Why only three? And the only answer that a rationalist has is, well, that's the only ones that occurred to me. Now, what if an opponent or somebody reasonable would say to him, well, why are those the only three possibilities? What if a thing acts partly through its nature, which is necessary but not sufficient condition, and also partly from an inner spontaneity? Therefore, there is no absolute cause and effect. Now, if we're going only by language, only by words, that is a completely irrefutable answer. The first guy made up three sets of words and eliminated two, and this guy added a fourth set of words. So that finishes the argument. Now, I'm not going to drag this out, but I could say even more to wipe that whole thing out. But the moral is that if you start with some formulation out of the blue that you didn't get from reality, it just, quote, occurred to you, and it seems obvious. That means since you didn't get it from reality, it has no clear application in your mind to reality, and it's therefore useless. Even though if you are a rationalist, it'll seem very neat and satisfying because it's basically like 3 minus 2 equals 1. There's three possibilities I thought of, and I refuted two. Therefore, the one that's left is causality, QED. 
Now, if you get any chill of satisfaction, that's a very bad sign from that type of reason. Now, what would a dictionary, excuse me, an inductive approach to causality consist of? Well, you'd have to start off by getting an idea, what are you talking about with causality? And I have found that it's helpful often to start with a dictionary definition of the key word or concepts in the principle to be uh, induced. There, if you get a decent dictionary, the reason is your definition will be completely uncontroversial. It won't have objectivism built into it, so there's no question of begging the question. It won't be too advanced because dictionaries are very unsophisticated and they give you just a common understanding. So the best thing, if you don't know where to start, instead of taking a definition that may have 10 objectivist things packed into it, get it something from an ordinary half-decent dictionary. Now, sometimes you can't. The dictionaries are hopeless or circular. But in this case, you can get a very simple one. Uh, I looked up and I have this old random house dictionary that we used uh, to uh, proofread Atlas Shrugged, and that's the one I still use. It's got a lot of flaws, but I know it very well. And they define causality to the effect that it's the principle that the world is orderly, lawful, or uniform. And that's, I think, the way most people uh, would see it. The world is orderly, the world is lawful, the world is uniform. Well, now, if we're starting there as our first step, the next thing we have to do is see what would we have to know to have reached that. We want to get this from observation. Obviously, we don't look out and see the world. The world is much too big to perceive. And we don't look out and see lawfulness. So what would we have to have known to reach this? And that's the type of question you're always going to ask when you induce. You're starting with something that's very broad and abstract, but you want to get it from reality. So you try to take it back to reality. And that, by the way, is called reduction. Simply asking yourself, what would I have to know to get to this thing? And maybe you'll find that to get to know the world is orderly, you had to know X. But to get to know X, you had to know W. And to get to know W and so on. And finally, you get to something you directly observe. Uh, and um, I'm going to say a little bit more about reduction later. But here it's very simple. What would you have to know to get such an idea as the world? Well, by the world, we mean the sum of things, all the things there are. So what concept did we obviously have to reach first before we could get the sum of things, every thing, all of the things, all of the objects, all of the what? entities that there are. Now notice the world doesn't mean the sum of quantities. It doesn't mean the sum of attributes. Quantities and attributes are just aspects of entities. So the first thing we'd have had to grasp is entity, thing. And then at a later stage we could grasp the world as a totality or summation of all those things. Now how would we get what would we have to grasp to get the idea of orderly or lawful? We're obviously saying, what is it that's orderly or lawful? Well, only entities, because that's all there is. But what about them would be orderly or lawful? Obviously, we're referring to and we had to know what to get the idea of order or law. That those entities do what? that they, they act a certain way. The same entity takes the same action. That's what we mean by lawful, in essence. Or the same kind of entity takes the same kind of action. In other words, an entity of a certain kind with a certain nature acts a certain way. 
And that's all there is to the world is uniform. So what have we really reduced uniform or lawful back to? Action, the concept of action, but what else in addition? An entity, we had to get the idea, not just an entity acts, because the same entity doesn't always do the same thing, but an entity of a certain kind will always act in a certain kind of way. So we're talking about the kind of entity, an entity with a certain nature, an entity with an identity. So there's really three concepts at the root here that we had to know before we could build up world and law and order and so on, and that is entity, action, and identity. And those, of course, uh, are axiomatic concepts according to objectivism. So uh, we're back down now to the kind of concepts that you get from direct observation. Thing, action, that a thing is uh, what it is. All right, now, assume that our inducer has grasped, has reduced, let us say, has reduced causality back to entity, identity, and action. And he can point to countless instances of entity, of identity, and of action without any hesitation. What is he to do now to get the conclusion that entities of a certain kind act a certain way? How is he going to get that conclusion? Is there something even earlier intellectually he had to know? Well, no, these are primary concepts. So what is it? How can he possibly get the information? Now, our goal in induction is to reach a, a primary level in which the answer, in which all we can say is the only way to get that information is to look out of reality. It's not something earlier we must have learned. Yeah, that's the jackpot or the contact point, the first contact with reality. And obviously this is the case. It's completely available perceptually. All you need to do is observe all sorts of entities of different kinds acting. With, you just observe without precondition. Uh, without preconception, instance after instance. And if you do that, what do you observe? Well, I gave the typical inductive examples in OPA. You shake the rattle, it makes a sound. You shake the pillow, it makes no sound. You push a ball, it rolls. You push a book, it doesn't move. You let a block go, it falls. You let a balloon go, it rises. I mean, you can do this, you know, even before graduate school. So, after enough instances, anyone is capable of generalizing from those observations. Things act in definite ways and only in those ways. That's it. Now, these are childlike examples. But the inductive method for adults consists of simply piling up instances of that same phenomenon. Now, why do you have to pile up instances? <clears throat> Partly, it's helpful to automatize the principle. So it's helpful for you simply psychoepistemologically. But epistemologically, cognitively, it's necessary before you induce that you have a wide range of instances. And why is that? Suppose all you ever did is study rattles, and you watched them shake, and they made sounds, whereas you shook a pillow and it made no sound. And that was it. You had a thousand examples of rattles and a thousand examples of pillows. You would not have a foundation for much of a conclusion. Because you don't know, what is the source of my conclusion? Maybe this is something unique to rattles or rattles and pillows. Maybe this holds only for man-made uh, objects in a home within the size range of a child. You still have no idea what the scope of your principle is. The more instances you have, especially if you deliberately try to change the example have as many different examples as you can, a wide range of examples, the more you have, 
the closer you come to the conclusion there's nothing, there's no accidental factor in common here except the thing which keeps popping up in every single context. It's like, for instance, if you tried to generalize all men are mortal and you only observed white male Californians and you watched, you know, time after time they die, you would be on very shaky ground to say all men are mortal. But as soon as you cast the net to include Americans and then the rest of the world and then females and then all the different races and then throughout the different centuries, etc., pretty soon there's nothing left in common except that they're human. And then if you cast the net even wider and you see that that includes animals and plants and so on, you get that they're living and there's nothing left in common, so you're justified in generalizing. So what you have to do now is go through the universe in your mind or in from your reading, what whatever you uh, know, and uh, see whether it's true that entities of a certain kind act in a certain way and only that way. Now, Ayn Rand sent me to, to perform this experiment on a causality walk. And she said, just try to find it. Find it everywhere. Keep looking around or Ever you see it, make a note and keep going. So I, as I remember, I went on this walk and the sun, I took the action of the sun. The sun melted the snow, but it warmed the roofs of the cars, but it blinded my eyes, but it moistened my forehead. Every entity in conjunction acted in accordance with its particular nature. And then there was a breeze and it bent the trees, but it made a match go out, and it made a pass a, a passerby bundle his coat, and it was just simply examples like that over and over. Uh, I saw a man hanging a picture in a window, using a hammering a small nail, and the nail was going in, and then I imagined him hammering a piece of crystal instead of the nail with just the same force and then hammering an icicle and all the differences according to my experience and the knowledge of what he's doing. Now, you, what you have to do before you uh, can induce causality is add as many as you can until you literally see it everywhere. Now, I am not going to do that for you in this course because I can't. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I would have to then spend hour after hour after hour, which is what Ayn Rand had to do originally, or whoever induces the principle, digesting dozens of concretes across dozens of fields uh, before you could induce. What I want to do is show you where to look for examples what kinds of examples to look for, and how to get from those examples to the principles that we're inducing in a given class. I can't give you the number or detail of examples that would be required to recreate a real process of induction, because then the class would consist basically of only chewing examples, which takes a tremendous amount of time. So there's a certain paradox. We're a course on using concretes to get to abstractions. We don't have much time to discuss concretes. But I don't think that this is an inherently contradictory assignment because I'm indicating to you every time in pattern what kind of thing would serve as examples and where you can find countless other examples. And it's then your assignment if you feel a need for a greater number or a greater range of examples to go home and find them to your heart's content. Uh, you can multiply the examples endlessly. So I don't actually induce the principles in the lectures in the sense of fully validating them by the proper range and quantity of examples. I just give you enough material so you can go back at your leisure and know exactly what to do. Now you're going to say to you, but how do I know how many examples or, or how many much of a range is enough? And the answer is, it's enough when you have sampled whatever your context tells you is relevant. 
take that down because it's really the solution to the problem of induction. It's enough to generalize when you've sampled whatever your context tells you is relevant. For instance, if you are living at a time when you think there's a huge difference between the things on earth and the things in the heavens, then it would be utterly unjustified. No matter if you had 10 million examples from this earth of causality uh, to, to generalize, You'd have to seek, and I find causality in the movements of the stars, in the movement of the planets, etc., in the movement of the sun. If you think there's an essential distinction between men and animals, then it's not enough. I mean, you know, or are living things in the inanimate. It's not enough to get all your examples of causality from one or from the other. Wherever you think there's a really big difference here, You've got to be sure you've sampled on both sides of the difference. Until, wherever you look, inside, outside, left, right, up, down, it doesn't make any difference. There is a connection between what a thing is and what it does. Given what it is, that is what it does, and you can't make it do anything else under the circumstances but that. And then you've got causality, and that is the sole proof that you're ever going to have. Simply, the complex of observations that a thing acts in definite ways and only these ways. Now, I want you to observe here, therefore, that in a sense, Hume is correct. You simply do observe regularity or uniformity, that an entity acts in certain ways. There is no little flag that comes out and says, this has to happen. You just observe it. Now, Hume wasn't satisfied with that. That's his problem. I'll comment about that more in a moment. But then I, I want to answer this question. You might say to me, well, what is the point or the value of giving a, quote, proof of causality such as I seem to have done in OPAR? Then you'll say to me, didn't you argue in OPAR an action has to be the action of an entity? And an entity is finite and limited because it has identity and therefore only one action is possible to the entity and therefore that's what it has to do and therefore that's uh, cause and effect. Wasn't that a proof that you gave in OPAR? And I say to you, it was not a proof. And I want to read you a paragraph in which... I say that explicitly on page 15 of the paper back. The above, what I've just said, is not to be taken as a proof of the law of cause and effect. I have merely made explicit what is known implicitly in the perceptual grasp of reality. I'm reading. Given the facts that action is action of entities and that every entity has a nature, both of which facts are known simply by observation. That's the only way you know that actions are actions of entities. You look at swimming and you see somebody swimming. Uh, you look at somebody and he is what he is. I say, given those facts, it's self-evident that an entity must act in accordance with its nature. And I quote from Ayn Rand, the law of causality is the law of identity applied to action. All actions are caused by entities. The nature of an action is caused and determined by the nature of the entities that act. A thing cannot act in contradiction to its nature. Unquote. Now, is she arguing? Well, since it can't act in contradiction to its nature, it must act accordingly, and therefore she's proved it. No. There's no content to those words as such. You have to say, what do you mean by acting according to your nature? And if you ask what that means, it means a thing of a certain kind acts in a certain way. And what would it mean to act contrary to its nature? It would mean the thing of a kind which acts a certain way doesn't act that way. So this is not a deductive proof. The proof is simply a restatement of the observations that led us to generalize. That's all. So now let me ask you. Ayn Rand says causality is identity applied to action. That was her formula. Does that mean then we have a proof of causality by deducing it from the law of identity? 
I say to you, you cannot deduce causality from identity. If you think you can, try. The law of identity tells you a thing is what it is. But it doesn't tell you what anything is. It doesn't even tell you that there are actions, let alone that actions are actions of things. As an abstract formulation, it precedes uh, 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 such issues as entity and action. So if your idea, and I know I'm, I wish I could see the faces around the country now, if your idea is, well, when you just induce, you just generalize, you know, from feathers and balls and so on, it's pretty shaky. But after I reach the generalization, I can then turn around and deduce it from some self-evident foundation like the law of identity, and that makes it, you know, secure and reliable. Wrong. That is Platonism. That is the idea that deduction is the only reliable knowledge and that induction is only suggestive. Now, if you believe in induction, then you have to believe that induction is a means of validating principles, not simply a means of thinking of them. It's not simply to suggest. It actually confirms the principles it suggests if you do it properly. Induction, and this is what you have to write down, is a valid form of cognition without requiring any deduction to supplement it. On its own. And if you think it requires deduction to validate it, where did you get your deduction from? It's going to have one general premise, which itself is inductive. So you're still going to find that induction is irreducible. So you may as well make up your mind to the painful and bitter fact, I mean to many objectivists, that you cannot get away from induction. Well, now then, let's ask this question. What was the point of bringing in the law of identity then? If all you can do is summarize, you know, all the things you observed acting, what is the point of having brought in the law of identity and say it's the law of identity applied to action? And why did I go through all of this has to act in accordance with its nature, and so on. Well, I want to tell you this point now. We did add something beyond generalization from instances, but we did not add a deductive proof. What did we add by going through the law of identity and its tie into causality? What did we add? We added a connection, an integration. We took a widespread observation, namely what led us to causality, and tied it in to principles established by earlier observation. So this was really the process. We have an unlimited set of observations condensed into identity and a distinct set of observations condensed into causality. Now, most people, the best people today, see no connection between those two. They hear that the world is uniform, and they say, yeah, I can see that. And they hear that A is A, and they say, oh, yes, sure, I see. I agree with that. I agree with logic. And they would never dream that there's a connection between those two. Now, Aristotle saw the connection, and Ayn Rand did. She saw what? That those two, identity and causality, fit together into one unit. That causality is an aspect of identity. Or put it another way, that all the concretes that come under causality also come under identity, along with lots of things that don't pertain to causality. This is a process of integration. Integration, by definition, is making a single whole out of parts. It's not the same as deduction. It's merely seeing the two things together belong and make one. Now, you should could ask me this question, well, isn't causality stronger or more convincing after you bring in its relationship to the law of identity? And I say yes and no. It depends on what you mean. 
in a sense, it's stronger because it's not isolated anymore. You've now tied it into the rest of your knowledge, to all the data that comes under the law of identity. You've made your knowledge a unity. Integration of your knowledge into a single whole, if you remember Opar, is an essential fact of the human method of cognition. And the essence of integration is to bind together more and more data, to reduce to unity greater and greater stretches of data. If you can't do this, you have no check on whether your information that you're just in reaching is consistent or not with the rest of what you know. Uh, uh, if you don't reduce it, your knowledge back to a single whole, basically, uh, it's not that you're doing something wrong, it's like you're leaving cognition in the middle without actually performing. It would be like you're in the middle of adding up a sum, and then the phone rings, and you talk on the phone and leave the room. Well, uh, what you did is not wrong, but you never add it. You never got to addition. You just quit in the middle. And the same is true with integration. Once you generalize, you have to tie it in to whatever you know that's relevant. And that process of integration is the process that finishes the cognitive uh, activity and makes it knowledge. Now, the fact that you have to do this doesn't mean that you are now therefore proving or validating what was earlier only a hypothesis. In other words, identity is simply causality in a wider formulation. So if you might say to me, well, which is more convincing, a broad abstraction or a narrower one? Identity is broader, causality is narrower. Well, that's another way of saying which is more convincing. All the concretes that are instances of identity or all the concretes that are instances of causality? Neither is more convincing. You can't say that one or the other is more convincing. In fact, the truth is not that one proves the other, but that the process is, what word am I going to say? A spiral. Each redounds on the other. That's what enables you to integrate. As soon as you see that causality comes under identity, you begin to appreciate more fully what is meant by identity. So causality actually strengthens or illuminates, clarifies, heightens for you the law of identity and vice versa. When you tie causality to identity, all the power of logic of the law of identity comes to causality. And you now see it's not just that things act a certain way. That's part of the very way I think when I think uh, logically. Identity becomes more convincing. You see it everywhere, and that in turn leads you to see causality everywhere. The goal in your thinking is a series of abstractions, each derived separately from observation and then integrated with the others, so that you have an increasing amount of concretes all united in one whole. And that is the, the point of integration. What it really does is reciprocally strengthen each element by combining them into a unit. That's the value of integration, if you want to write that down. That's going to be from my next book. What integration does is reciprocally strengthen each element by combining them into a unit. And you're going to find this time and again. We'll induce something. You'll see, oh, that connects to this and that and the other. And the connection will make what we induced clearer, and at the same token, what we induced is going to make the earlier things we knew clearer and more convincing. They're going to redound back and forth, and that's the spiral. We'll keep coming back, we'll keep seeing causality a thousand times, or at least in this course five more times, six more, and each time 
They'll say, oh, I see causality much better than I did when I, even when I tied it to identity. And I see identity better now, and each one is going to make each one better. Now, the temptation that you have to overcome is the Humean one, which is, well, when I accumulate examples, I see that causality is so, but I don't see why. That's what human concept. And therefore, what you need is a proof to give you the necessity of the principle. And then they said, there is no such proof. Now, that is wrong. A summary of the facts, can't, you cannot expect over and above that some entity called necessity. You have to throw out the whole idea of the necessary versus the contingent. Just throw it out, and if you have doubts, Read my article on the analytic synthetic. But if you say to me, well, but why does causality have to be true? Just because it is. There is no answer to that question. Causality is true, and you learn that by observing reality. Just as A is A, you could just as reasonably ask me, but why does A have to be A? And if you have the illusion, well, that I understand, but I don't understand causality, it's an illusion. <clears throat> if you don't allow arbitrary what-ifs, such as, well, what if a ball did turn into an ice cream cone when you pushed it? Or what if we came across a type of radiation that was a wave and wasn't at the same time, which is what physicists say. If you don't al allow those arbitrary projections, you have no need for a need and necessity over and above uh, the facts. So the real argument against Hume is not that he is attacking a, quote, necessary truth. The real thing is that he is blasting the total of our integrations because all of our knowledge is integrated into one total. So if you attack one element of it, you're wiping it all out if it's truly integrated. And that's why he's a total skeptic, at least he was consistent. Now I want to give you a thinking assignment for the next class. I have 20 minutes as I time it. And I lost some time, remember, because of all the... It, it finally ended up working. Uh, if anybody's still there who can hear me, I don't know. Uh, I want to give you a thinking assignment for the next class, along with a lot of tips on how to start it, how to try to do it. And next week we're going to take a, as simple a principle of objectivism as you can get from the fountainhead, but it's crucial to objectivism. It's a lot more complicated than cause and effect because it's not almost an axiom. But it's not too complicated. It's not nearly as hard as some later ones are going to be. The principle is that man's basic means of survival is reason. And I want you to write down this assignment. How would you learn this principle? Strictly from observation of reality. The principle that man's basic means of survival is reason. How would you learn it inductively? So you're going to have to answer these sub-questions. A. Not necessarily in this order, but I'm just giving you sub-questions that you'd have to grope with. Where would you start? What kind of perceptual observations would begin this whole thing? Two, what stages, if any, would you have to go through? Can you go directly from observation to a conclusion? Or do you go from observation to a preliminary conclusion, and then from that to another, and then from that to another, and finally you get to, therefore, my ultimate conclusion is man's means of survival is reason. And three, you will have to consider this question. What other ideas of objectivism, if any, do you need to rely on to come to this conclusion? For example, this is part still of C. Do you have to know that reason is man's only means of knowledge and that mysticism is invalid? Do you have to know that to grasp that man's means of survival is reason? Or, 
So you have to know what a concept is to grasp the idea of reason. Now, have you ever come across something that you really have to know that's a whole big mess and knot in itself? Just write down, you have to know A, B, and C, and I'm not trying to do them too. I'm taking them for granted. But I'm choosing them in such a way that there's not very much you have to know. <clears throat> now, it may help you to, to, if you have difficulty knowing how to approach this assignment, to try to imagine you're explaining this idea to a young adult, a high school graduate in Atlanta, say. In other words, you can assume a great deal of knowledge already. You're not, you are not trying to explain this principle to a baby, which is out of the question. You can assume a full conceptual vocabulary with all the appropriate definitions, except you cannot assume any philosophic definition. You can't assume the definition of reason. You, your subject, to the, your student is literate. He has all the data accumulated by the human race relevant to this principle. He's thoroughly conversant with science, history, literature. So you're not starting from scratch in the sense of bringing up an idiot. And I often will use my daughter because I have a clear sense what she would and wouldn't know and thereby avoid assuming whole chunks of objectivism in my answer. Now, I say that because you must not try to establish this by looking for other ideas of objectivism from which you can derive. That is not what we're doing. That's the opposite of what we're doing. Uh, it's completely pointless, for instance, to say, oh, I know how to prove that uh, man's means of survival is reason. I know that man is a creature who survives by changing his background rather than just adapting to it. And, of course, you couldn't change your background without the faculty of reason, and therefore man's means of survival must be reason. How do you know that he survives by changing his background? Oh, that's because Ayn Rand said that. That doesn't count. What did you see that led you to that conclusion? You say, well, I remember a lecture. That is not induction. You So... Don't scrounge around for any other objectivist idea. In fact, if one occurs to you, just throw it out. You want to go right to reality, even if you have to go back to get, if it's complicated to find your way back to it. Now, it may not be helpful for you to think of teaching someone, uh, because the problem is that you may get involved with your projection of his confusions or polemics uh, you'll start safeguarding against objections that a professor would make, and then you're lost totally. If you try to project a professor's mind, first of all, you get sick to your stomach. But secondly, you confuse yourself intellectually to such a point that you can't perform the uh, homework. So uh, use another person, a young person, only as a pedagogic guide, and you don't have to if it's confusing. The real issue is, what perceptions of reality are necessary for you to see yourself that man's means of survival is reason? Now, here's some more advice as to what to do. Your goal is to get down to perceptual concretes, we said. And the broader the range, and the more of them, the better. Now, I don't mean purely perceptual, the way a baby would see them, or even a year old one. We're talking about concretes, the way a high school student would describe them. So you don't literally start with shapes and colors. You start from perceived objects already known, understood, the way an adult will describe them. The point is, however, they must be directly available to human observation, and you have to drudge up, write it down again, a flood of these concretes, not only one or two. It has to be like the causality walk. Everywhere you look, you see that man's means of survival is reason. You can't turn around, and there it is again. 
at minimum, you must have six to eight widely different examples that convey to you the whole range of reality relevant to this principle. Now, you don't have to write anything out, obviously. These are notes for yourself. Uh, we're going to be taking that up next week. Now, uh, let me also point out this to you, another kind of advance warning. We are going out of our way to focus simply on the relation between a principle and reality, not a principle and its relation to other principles. Now, of course, because knowledge is hierarchical, you strictly can't ignore everything else that you know. There's very few principles that you can go like causality directly from the observation to the generalization. Usually we build principles on earlier principles and so on. But what we can do and what I want you to do is streamline the process wherever possible. In other words, wherever it's possible to get the nucleus of the idea, even if in primitive form, while omitting some step or some point or some aspect, then omit it. If you can get it without a given gimmick or twist or qualification, do it in a primitive way. Think up the barest minimum in terms of the steps necessary to get from observation to the principle. The point here is to learn to start somewhere and to reach an early version of the principle. You can then make note of what you have and haven't established, how it differs, let us say, from the full statement of that principle in my book or in, in, in uh, Ayn Rand. And then you can project what would be necessary later, what other inductions would be necessary to fill the whole thing out. It will only be the same process of induction over and over again. Uh, but the assignment here is to reach the principle that I gave you in the earliest form that a literate adult could take it in. Or if you use the term context, the earliest context which would qualify as a grasp of that principle. Now, it must be a grasp of that principle. If all you grasp, for instance, is Consciousness is necessary for man to survive. That's not yet reason. But obviously, you don't have to grasp that it's a type of consciousness that omits measurements. And that's what enables him to survive. So it's something in between those two formulations. Whatever is the earliest. Now, I, I think with regard to every principle, there's the earliest point at which the mind grasps it at all. And the rest is then enriching, elaborating, seeing new applications, qualifications, integrating, spiraling, etc. What I want you to do is capture on this principle the first truly philosophic formulation. And then later, when you go on to, to get more com complicated. But we want the connection between the idea and its roots to be unmistakable. Once you grasp this method on a handful of issues, you can use the same basic methodology to guide you through all of the complexities still to come. Now, a couple of other warnings here. <clears throat> Your purpose here is logic and not history. In other words, I'm asking you to reconstruct your knowledge in order to demonstrate its objective validity, in other words, its basis in reality, to reconstruct your knowledge. That's the term. And that's not the same thing necessarily as tracing the actual historical steps that any given child went through to gain the knowledge. What you're doing is starting as an adult with a piece of information and then saying, how would we now proceed in order to acquire this principle if we had to start from observation. It's not how did I as a child actually learn this and my aunt may have told me or I may have discovered it from uh, Ayn Rand. It's not even how would anyone other than a genius ever come up with this because maybe only a genius could come up with this. But the point is she already has. And the question we're asking is, do we really get it? 
Do we know how as adults to construct a path step by step from observation to the principle that Ayn Rand has already told us about? It may take a genius to construct or create it, but it only infinite patience and effort to recreate or reconstruct it. Uh, all right. And now I want to give you a clue if it helps you. There seem to be some methods that you can use. I say there seem to be. To help you here. Uh, actually, two methods that could help you. Some of them are more useful. One of these methods is more useful in certain cases and one another, and sometimes both together are helpful. They will, these methods will help you figure out where to start and what stages occur. And I call these two methods the reduction method and the genus method. The first was originally suggested to me by my wife Amy and the second by Harry Binswanger. We're going to be restating them over and over during the course, and I know we're running out of time. I just want to give you a clue to the two of them in our last five minutes, if it helps you at all. If this is too fast, don't worry, because we'll be back over it every week. Reduction is very much like the reduction that I did in OPAR on the term friend. Uh, and it consists of asking this question, whether you do it on a concept or on a whole principle. What would you have to have known to reach this? What would you have to have known to reach this? And then, if you say, I had to know X to get to this, the X, if I knew X, that would get me to the principle I'm after. Then is X something you could have got directly from perception? Yes? Okay, you're home free. No? Well, what would you have to have known to get to X? You say T. Okay. How about T? If I knew T, I could get to X. If I knew X, I could get to the principle. How would I know T? At some point in this reduction, if you're doing it correctly, you're going to say the only way to know that is direct observation. And then you've hit the jackpot. That is one method. And of course, then the stages of the induction will just consist of traversing the same ground backward. You go from observation to T, and then to X, and then to your principle, and that'll be your final induction. That's the reduction method. Now, how it applies here, you got a week to figure out. Now, the genus method was suggested to me by Harry. And he said, in essence, we form concepts by differentiating certain entities from others within a broader category or genus. We form the concept of table by differentiating it from chair, say, within the broader category of furniture. This broader category sets the aspect of reality we're talking about. And then when we differentiate within it, we have a concept of a specific identity. So the concept of table is a type of the genus, furniture, as against such and such, which is chair or bed. Both elements, the genus and the differentia, are essential to our grasp of what the table is. Now Harry said to me, in effect, one day when I was floundering, why don't we apply this to propositions? Doesn't every proposition that we induce represent an identification within a broader genus? And doesn't it then contrast with other propositions within that genus? So in this case, our genus would be a super broad principle. And our induction would be a narrower generalization within that super broad principle. A generalization differentiated from other generalizations under that principle. Now, this, it turns out, has a really great value if you can figure out what is the genus of the principle you're trying to induce. So here, to get a clue, you go to a broader principle than the one you're trying to, and then you try to subdivide your genus into subcategories until you finally come directly to observable concretes. And then again, it's just like on your reduction. You turn around and go back up. But this time, instead of going 
what would I have to have known? You start from the most general and break it down. Now that's very vague, I grant you. But if you want a clue to a genus that might be helpful in connection with this induction, you might think that every living species has a means of survival. I'm giving you that as a clue. Now, the relation of these two methods, they're really two ways of doing the same thing. But the reduction method infers logically a string or line of connections. The genus method lays out the whole field before you. It like it gives you a map or survey of the whole territory. And then you can locate your specific induction within a total field. And um, it, since it's the same material, they're both going to come up with the same principle as to how to start and what stages to go through. Uh, and now just, well, one other quick thing I want to tell you. Whenever you make inductions involving human behavior, it is essential to look to world history as a final confirmation. That is, as part of the range of what you're doing. Do not confine yourself only to the 20th century. As Nietzsche pointed out, we have to be sure we're describing human nature and not just a mood of this century. So if you have found that X is crucial to man, you should be able to find historical periods where X was present and good consequences took place, and historical periods where X was absent and bad consequences took place. And that is going to be essential uh, to showing your final uh, induction. So don't forget about history. Now, I, I want to give you just really, I won't even take four minutes, but one last thought that may help to uh, motivate you in this whole course. And that is what the problem is really with precocious objectivists. And I include myself in that description as of some decades ago. I'm too old to be precocious now, but years ago. And the problem that precocious objectivists have is that we get too much too soon. In other words, we learn powerful ideas before we see the need of all of those ideas. We get answers from Ayn Rand before the questions even assert themselves clearly in our mind. We get a lifetime of answers and we barely have a few questions. We get massive integrations before we know what we're integrating. What happens is you hear a powerful case from a historic genius, either uh, through Atlas Shrugged or whatever, you get a tremendous sense of conviction because Ayn Rand's power of presentation sweeps you into her whole way of looking at reality. And then you come out from the book, but you don't really know what had to go into it to get that perspective. And then you spend years trying to fully understand or recreate or hold on to it or worst of all, trying to validate it against professors or bosses who are spend their time trying to batter it down. And you're in this struggle, but you don't realize what it actually depends on, which is the mass of observations that Ayn Rand grasped originally from age four and five and so on. The perceptual experiences that she saw one by one, principle by principle, as crying out for induction, condensation, and integration. So what you have to do at this point now, if you really want to master this material, is forget about all books, whether mine or Ayn Rand's. Forget about lectures. Don't try to remember any set of words that once made it all seem clearer to you. And, of course, forget all about professors and bosses or wives, whoever it is that would inspire polemics in you. Let go of all of these artifices now What and simply concern yourself with one question. What do you, what does your mind in the stillness of your own mind, what do you need to grasp such and such a principle from reality? That is the only question, and it's not easy. 
but it can be done and it gets it gets easier and sometimes harder but it's a I'm now convinced that this is a learnable skill that it's not just hit or miss and that you know after I don't say after this course but after some time you will be able actually to recreate the whole of objectivism and uh, have a, a confidence in your philosophy that is impossible from merely having lectures uh, uh, on it. And we're going to start uh, on one of the easier principles of uh, uh, man's means of survival is reason. Next week, I'm going to plunge right into how would you reach this by induction and devote the whole class to it, trying to make use of all the tips and methods and define them all further. Each week, we'll try to get even clearer on the methods as we apply them to the new content. So I think I've just exactly used my time up. So thank you very much. And uh, I'll look forward to whatever questions you have. And I will meet you again in one week. Good night or good morning or good afternoon.